असतो मद्गमय तमसो मोतिर्गमय मृत्योर्मात गमय ओ शाति 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 Om lead us from the unreal to the real lead us from darkness unto light lead us from death to immortality om peace 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 we'll go into the meditation now It'll be very easy to meditate after a nice lunch you know <laughs> <laughs> sleep was always a problem in the main monastery where we were there we in calcutta on the bank of the ganga the ganges we used to um it was often hot and muggy and we the, the novice monks we were always a little always a little uh, sleep deprived i think so meditation was the r- right time to I remember one of our teachers senior teacher senior monk sort of pleading with us don't fall asleep straight away he was <laughs> he he was uh, sympathetic to our plight but another monk told me once um that he was sitting and he said that particular time i felt my meditation was really good until i felt somebody from the back you know hitting me with this cloth like hitting me just like this <laughs> and I looked back and i saw this other monk sitting behind me and saying you know in a furious whisper hey you sleep all you want why are you snoring and he thought that the meditation was particularly good at that time <laughs> he really thought that so all right i won't uh, judge you if you sleep but i'll judge you if you snore <laughs> if your neighbor snores you have the ri- i give you here by give you the right to wake him up <laughs> yeah you switched off the fans uh, are you feeling warm yes yes <laughs> you need the fans or you don't need the fans yes. you need the fans yeah oh no let, let the fans be there no problem Mm. the sound you mean uh, like a like a knocking sound or yeah that's good you can use it for meditation no really i mean it any kind of rhythmic sound use it to point back towards what is aware of that you can actually it's it disturbs you when you're trying to do things like follow the breath but it's very useful when you're trying to do the second one the insight meditation thing all right Let's try. Sit straight, relaxed but alert, especially alert now. Breathing normally when you are comfortable, close your eyes, put your hands in a comfortable posture. Breathing normally, listen to my voice. bring your attention gently to the breath breathing in exhaling hmm i see what you mean by this fan making the sound you can use the sound itself to direct your attention back as you breathe in count 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 15 16 17 18 19 20 the mind will wander but don't let that worry you moment you recognize that your mind has wandered away bring it back to the breath and count one again and so on we'll do it for 10 minutes
when you are comfortable, you can open your eyes, look down at your lap first before raising your eyes. And take the help of a text. It's one of the introductory texts to Vedanta written by Shankaracharya about 1400 years ago. It's called Aparokshanubhuti. Do we have any copies of it here? Um, so if you're interested, you can get a copy later on. Shankaracharya talks about Vedanta, introduces Vedanta in the bulk of this text, but towards the end of the text, from verse number 100 onwards, what Shankara does is what we are doing in this retreat. He takes up the two paths, the path of meditation, yoga, and the path of insight, Vedanta. He takes up both. And he does it in a unique way, what, in slightly humorous, maybe a little, little mischievous way also. What he does is he takes up the names, uh, he takes the terms from yoga and gives the yogic meaning and the Vedantic meaning. Here he's talking about Vedantic meditation, what we are trying to do. And this Vedantic meditation, he uses yogic terms. So there is an original yogic meaning for that. And then there is a Vedantic meaning for it. So he juxtaposes both. There is a preliminary practice, which is a yogic practice. There's an advanced practice, which is an, an insight practice, what we are talking about, insight meditation. So, 15 terms. He takes up 15 terms. Eight of them are familiar to you from Ashtanga Yoga of Patanjali. In Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, you find the system of eight-limbed yoga. People translate it as eight steps, but actually it's eight limbs for one thing. Like we have got limbs. Similarly, eight limbs of yoga, Ashtanga yoga. So eight of these terms are familiar to us. What are these eight terms? First of all, the moral practices and disciplines. Yama, the Niyama, the moral practices and disciplines, we'll see that. And then Asana, how to sit. You say, you've got to learn how to sit? Yes. There's a lot to learn about how to sit. So, asana. Then third is pranayama. Control of the breath. You have to learn how to breathe? I've been doing that all my life. Yes, you have to learn how to breathe. I saw this book, uh, Iyengar. There's an interview with BK's Iyengar. Actually, three great Hatha Yoga masters came over from India. Um, Iyengar, Krishnamacharya and... Um, and uh, Pattabhi Joyce. So, uh, mo interestingly enough, they're all from the same area, from um, Mysore area, yeah. So, they came over. Uh, Iyengar's book is very famous, Lights on Yoga, I think. In one interview, he says, interesting, that he says he was amazed to discover when he started teaching in the West that people here, those who were coming, walking into the yoga studio, they were hardly breathing at all. You see, how are they alive? Well, that's a surprising thing. <laughs> They're breathing with the upper part of the chest. You know? It comes out of anxiety. So, a full, full belly and chest breath. So, breathing, yes, we have to learn how to breathe also. Control of the breath, pranayama. Not, not in order to get a full breath into our lungs, which is a good idea, but actually to control the mind. Uh, the idea is that if you directly try to control the mind, it's difficult. It's subtle. That's what Arjuna was complain complaining about to Krishna. 
in the sixth chapter of the Gita, after having been taught meditation, he complains that it's, it's too difficult. One easier way is to first catch hold of something that you can catch hold of. That is the breath. And the breath is actually linked to our mind. It's somehow linked to our nervous system. So when you are excited, angry, you breathe harder, harsher, uh, erratically. When you are feeling dull and sleepy, there's a kind of heavy breathing glowing, going on. When you are concentrated, mind is light and sattvic and aware, you will find different kind of breathing going on. There is a meaning to it, breathing through the left nostril, the right nostril, both nostrils and so on. Anyway, there's the whole science of it. There are books on it, just the science of breathing. Pranayama, that's the fourth. The fifth one is, remember the whole point is to meditate. So the fifth one is, then you begin to gradually withdraw the senses. Turn the senses inwards, pratyahara. Ahara means taking from the world. Ahara literally means eating. Now eating through the five senses. The eyes eat forms, as, so, as it were. They, they, that's what it takes in. Ears sound, smell and taste and touch. Instead of doing that, we turn inwards. Basically, withdrawal of the senses means you can close the eyes, but what about the ears and the nose and the skin? Basically, withdrawal of the senses means turning the mind away from the senses so that sense inputs are not part of your processing anymore. Pratyahara. Ahara means taking from the world. Pratyahara, reverse. Not taking in from the world. Then comes dharana. Dharana literally means focus, holding on to. You, we read about vritti, chitta vritti, modification of the mind. Now they are continuously going on. Right now they are going on. But each chitta vritti is about something. Something means vishaya, object. Every ob modification of the mind has an object. Now when successive vrittis have different objects, that's our normal state. We see something, we hear something, we recall something, we want something, we feel something. It continuously keeps on changing. But when every successive vritti is about the same thing, that is called focus. I have a modification about this book, and next about the book, next about the book, next about the book. Focus, focus, focus. So that is dharana. It will be intermittent and broken at this state. Mind will be distracted, it'll go here and there and come back and you'll bring it back again. It'll go away again, bring it back again. That is dharana. When it becomes continuous, it is dhyana, meditation. Seventh, seventh, seventh limb, meditation, dhyana. And dhyana finally gets absorbed. The final stage is not done through effort. It deepens of itself into samadhi. So meditation is difficult. It's the seventh limb of, of eight limbs. The seventh. That's why uh, we, people say, keep saying, I'm meditating. But it's not so easy at all. Yes, you're sitting. What else you're doing? <laughs> um, dhyana. That deepens into the deepest absorption called samadhi. But that samadhi also in Patanjali Yoga is uh, sampragyata samadhi. Samadhi with object. I am meditating on this. And hold that deepens into subject object less awareness itself without any subject object. That is asampragyanta samadhi. And that is supposed to reveal to you that you are the witness self. That you are aware, even without thinking any of anything particularly, even without any movement of the mind, you are still aware. Clearly, then you are not the mind, not the body. It's something apart from it. These eight names are used by Shankara, plus he adds seven more, taken from different texts of yoga, and gives each of these 15 unique Vedantic connotation. So we'll see. Each of these 15 becomes a separate Vedantic meditation. If you're doing yogic meditation, you need to do all 15. You need to do all 15. You can't do, I'm sitting, but I won't practice the breathing, or I'm practicing the breathing, but I will not concentrate. You can't do that. You have to do all 15. Whereas in Vedantic meditation, anyone is a doorway to that ever-present awareness. So let's see. All these things, they work because if the background of Vedanta is there. So as almost everybody or everybody has been studying Vedanta, either at the center or through the YouTube talks or in your own way. So you know what we are talking about. 
if you're absolutely a newcomer, if you plunge into this at this point, it will seem uh, uh, you'll feel like uh, rootless. You know, what am I? What are we doing exactly? But not for this this group. I know. In this book, in um, verse number hundred and two and hundred and three, he gives the list of the fifteen. Uh, fifteen steps of um, the yogic meditation and the 15 Vedantic meditation, the, the same names, the 15 names. Yamo hi niyamas tyago maunam deshas chakalata asanam mula bandhascha deha samyam chadrikstitihi prana sanyamanam chaiva Pratyaharascha dharana, Atma dhyanam samadhishcha, Proktanyangani vaikramat. So the limbs of yoga, both Jnana Yoga and Raja Yoga actually are mentioned here. What are they? Yama, Niyama, the moral practices. Tyaga, he introduces another one, renunciation. Maunam, silence. Desha, appropriate place. Kala, appropriate time. Then asana, sitting. Mulabandha, the lock. I'll explain when time comes. Deha samyam, the posture while sitting. Drikstiti, where to keep your eyes. Prana sangyamanam, control of the breath. Pratyahara, focus. No, withdrawal. Dharana, focus. Atma Dhyanam, meditation on the self, and Samadhi. So these 15. Let's take them up one by one. First one. This is called Yama. Sarvam Brahmeti Vigyanad Indriyagrama Sangyamaha Yamo Yamiti Samprokto Abhyasaniyo Muhur Muhu before I go into this, this is the Vedantic meaning. Let me first give the yogic meaning. What is yama? The preliminary moral practices. Spirituality is possible on the basis of ethics. One can be a good person without being particularly spiritual. But one cannot be a spiritual person without being good. So uh, morals, ethics, that is the basis. Dharma is the basis of moksha. For, for spiritual life, dharma is the basis. Now, yama has five universal values. What are they? Um, the first is uh, ahimsa, non-injury, non-harming others, non-violence. Gandhiji was famous for it. Jainism is the central practice. The central value in Jainism is uh, ahimsa. Then satyam, truth, integrity, truth, honesty. Satyam, second. Third one, Brahmacharya. It means self-control. Literally, it means celibacy. But it all, it, in a general sense, it means self-control, sense control. Control of sense organs. Then, um, Asteya, non-stealing. Aparigraha, non-acceptance of gifts. So, let me quickly talk about these. Ahimsa, very important. Non-violence in thought, word and deed. Not only you must not hit, punch the other guy, you must not even threaten to do so, in, uh, use threatening words. And you must not even think about it, of, of harming others. So, non-violence in thought, word and deed. Then, truth, of course, very important. Sri Ramakrishna used to say, Shotto koli tapasya, that means, the spiritual austerity, the, the, austerity the, the, the practice that one must hold on to in this age, is truth. Uh, truth is the foundation of spiritual life. We are looking for the ultimate reality of the universe. So looking for reality, if you don't stick to the real, if I tell lies and I am looking for the ultimate reality, there is a contradiction right away at the very beginning. Um, look at the word for truth in Sanskrit, satyam. It comes from the word sat. Sat means true or real. It also means the ultimate reality, Brahman. Being, existence, isness. 
then brahmacharya sense control um especially uh, uh, celibacy mahatma gandhi when he was you know he uh, his uh, free, in the freedom struggle in his ashram he would insist on these values now there were people in the uh, the politicians who were fighting for india's independence they also they agreed with mahatma gandhi's uh, policy of non violence but they being politicians they thought it was a strategy the british rulers were strong and powerful and of course you can't go and fight a war against them so it's much better to undertake the path of civil resistance and non violence but gandhi did not see it as as a policy or a strategy he saw it as a spiritual value not just in the case of a political struggle for what is right but for everything in life now when he insisted on see they were on board with his policy of uh, with his uh, teachings of truth and non violence but when he talked about sense control many of them were householders and married people and they thought what's the need of all of that this brahmacharya what's the need so they criticized that and i remember reading a letter by mahatma gandhi he says sorrowfully that little do they realize that it is so difficult to practice these individually if you practice them together all of them become uh, easier i will be only truthful but i'll be violent and given given to a dissolute life very soon i will find very difficult to tell the truth also i will be non violent but i'll tell lies it's difficult to practice non violence that way also you'll end up hurting people so all the values are to be practiced together non stealing of course asteya not taking what is does not belong to you aparigraha not taking what is excessive it belongs to you people have given it to you remember often these were the values prescribed for monks so monks live upon gifts given by society and so immediately hoarding will become a problem if people are especially generous then whatever it is food you often find somebody said this you monks i find either they are as uh, thin as skeletons or fat as elephants <laughs> This one said in Bengali, "Oh, this Hindu man is very good. I don't like these monks. You know, they are Kongkali moton roga, na le hati moton mota hobe. They are like thin, like uh, skeletons, or fat, like elephants. Why? Because uh, you you oversupply, uh, abundance of food supplied by. I I saw um, Buddhist societies are heavily monastic, especially Theravada the Buddhist societies. So it was interesting. I saw on the net." A, a government circular given by the government of sri lanka which is a buddhist country the government is issues a circular to the devotees they don't overfeed the monks because <laughs> because they are it's it's a it's it's a it's a federal law don't overfeed the monks because uh, they they're falling ill and we are <laughs> the medical bills are too high in one of our ashrams with a beautiful lawn there was a sign don't feed the squirrels and i said we should add don't feed the squirrels and the monks <laughs> so don't take what is given to you in excess of what what you need and actually it's a, it's remarkable how little we need to survive vivekananda said the west seems to be bent on demonstrating how much one can acquire and india seems to be trying to demonstrate how little one can live on <laughs> Uh, the uh, the wandering monks in india and so on there's a story of uh, it was in prabuddha bharatam i've seen such people in the in the himalaya as a monk who had his begging bowl where he would get his food beg for food and in one day it got broken and there was this devotee once um who a, a devotee who used to come there he would see if the monks needed something and he would go and um, buy it from the nearby town which is uttarkashi so he told this monk i'll get a begging bowl for you when next time i come back i'm going down to the plains uttarkashi itself is not the plains it's 5000 feet in the uh, hills so he comes back after a week and the monk with a new begging bowl and the monk says i don't need it but he said you you wanted it you agreed said, yes but 
um, these last week, I begged with my joint palms, you know, with my, this is called Karatala Bhiksha, with, the, with these palms. With, so, yes. So I, I begged with my uh, palms joined and uh, I found it, it's all right. I don't need a bowl. This is enough for uh, getting my food. So, aparigraha, don't take more than what, what you need. The reason is, the moment you accept gifts, it obliges you, you know. Uh, you, you are under an obligation. It's a huge thing here. Because giving gifts, so you have to use common sense. You live in, in the USA, in a, a country where giving gifts is part of the social culture. Now if you just say, no, nah, I'm not going to take any gifts, I'm not going to give you any gifts. Now you'll be a social pariah in no, no time at all. Now, that you should not do, but common sense should be used, yes. Uh, so a balance should be used. The moment you accept something, a little bit of an obligation comes to you, even subtly. And because in meditation, the mind becomes subtle. So basically, control over our impulses, desires, moral control. This is the, these are the yama. And what does Shankaracharya say? He says, Sarvam Brahmeti Vijnanad Indriya Grama Sangyamaha Yamo Yamiti Samprokta. What is Yama? Truth and, uh, and self control, sense control, and non violence, and non stealing, and non acceptance of gifts. He says, No, 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 no. The, from the awareness that all is Brahman, and I am that Brahman. Control of the senses, self-control comes automatically. This particular person, its life becomes controlled automatically, righteous automatically. That is called yama. How does that work? How does, you, how does one get control over one's desires, for example, by realizing everything is Brahman? So this is where I tell the story of the princess of Kashi. <laughs> but this audience, the problem is, You've heard it all. <laughs> I remember uh, telling a professor in, uh, this was in Oxford University. He's a very interesting gentleman. He is an Indian, Rana Mitter. He, but he is an expert on China affairs. He is uh, the top expert in Oxford on China affairs. In fact, you know, the series is there, Oxford, very short introductions very short introductions. He has written the book on China, uh, very short introduction to China. Anyhow, I was speaking with him and I said in this day of um, you know, YouTube and uh, internet and all, the problem is if I go to, from one audience to the other, they've heard it all. And so I don't have new things to say. Vedanta is, it, the book was written 5,000 years ago and it's finished. So it just says one thing, that you are Brahman, and there's nothing new to say there. So what, how can I keep saying new things to new audiences? Um, and he said some, uh, he gave some nice advice. He said, no, 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 you don't have to do that. When rock bands come and play, people are all eager to hear the golden oldies. <laughs> if uh, the Beatles come and play, and they say, well, you're going to sing some new songs which I composed yesterday. You say, no, we want to hear Imagine, or uh, <laughs> something like that, you know. Uh, we don't want to hear your latest composition. So that way it's good. The golden oldies. I've got, I'm full of golden oldies. <laughs> now, there was uh, in a kingdom in ancient India, a drama was being staged in the court. And um, one of the ro characters in that, in that play, uh, a play was being staged. One of the characters in that play was the princess of Kashi, who was supposed to be a little princess, a little girl. Now there was nobody to play the role, and the queen said, you can, the prince is very young, he's only five years old, so you can dress him up as a girl, and he will be the princess of Kashi. And so the, in the play, the prince was dressed up as a princess, and he played the role of the princess of Kashi. And he looked so cute that the mother said, the queen said, paint a portrait of the prince in that dress. Nowadays it would have been a selfie, you know, you can just take a selfie. <laughs> I often see people taking selfies in Central Park. 
Mm. How interested we are in ourselves. I see the selfie as a spiritual quest. You want to know what I am. You know, you really want to see. <laughs> and Brahma Jnana, self-realization, Atma Jnana, I call it the ultimate selfie. <laughs> it is basically the ultimate. I should give a talk called that, the ultimate selfie. <laughs> So a portrait was painted of the prince in that dress of the, of the little princess and written princess of Kashi dated so and so. Years passed, 15 years later, the prince was now quite grown up and doing prince-like things, you know, riding and hunting and studying and all of that. One day, he was rummaging around in the cellars of the palace and he chanced upon this old painting and he wiped the dust of it and he looked at it and he saw the date. And he fell in love. He said, this girl is my age. She must be my age now. Look at the date. And I want to marry this princess. And I'll never be happy unless I marry the princess of Kashi. And he was shy, so he couldn't tell his mother or much less his father. And the king and the queen worried about him. Why is he moping? Why has he suddenly changed? Um, he's not paying attention to anything. He just sits quietly you know, and li writes love poetry or whatever. <laughs> not paying attention to his studies. Now the wise old minister took him aside. Prince, what ails you? What is your problem? Uh, tell me, you can confide in me. And the prince said, I'm in love. And I'll never be happy until I marry this, um, this girl. Oh, very good. Who is she? She's the princess of Kashi. Oh, princess, um, even better. Royal wedding. So you can... <laughs> So, very good. Princess of Kashi, where did you meet her? I haven't actually met her, but I have seen her picture. Picture? Where did you see the picture? It's an old picture painted a long time ago. There's a date there, but she's my age. I can see. Um, old painting of the princess of Kashi. The minister begins to remember something vaguely. Where did you see this painting? Downstairs in the cellar. Take me to that painting. And so they go down and he brings out the painting and the minister sees that and he tells the prince, you need to sit down. <laughs> <laughs> this is not the princess of Kashi. The prince says, whoever she is, I'll marry her. Uh, it's uh, actually, this is the story that uh, the um, a play was staged here 15 years ago and we wanted somebody to play the princess of Kashi. And you, at that time, you were a young little, little boy, and the queen said, we should dress you up as the princess, and we dressed you up. And you looked so good in that role that your mother, the queen, her highness said, oh, we should paint a portrait of you, and this is that portrait. Tat tua masi, that thou art. <laughs> now, what happens to the princess' desire for the princess of Kashi? It goes away. But why does it go away? Because she is unattainable? No. Because there is no princess of Kashi apart from me, the prince. That one is one with me, ever attained. Seems to be different from me and worth attaining. It's not different from you, it is you. The world is our princess of Kashi. Swami Vivekananda said, things are dead in themselves. We breathe life into them, then we run after them or we run away from them. We alone appear as the world. There is nothing in this world apart from you, that awareness which we are talking about. In that awareness alone, the world appears, exists, plays and disappears. It is nothing apart from that awareness. When you focus on this, immediately the specific desire, I want this, I want that, this should happen, that should not happen, this will all go away. What should happen and what should not happen, it's all you. What do I have to get hold of and what do I have to get rid of? It is all me. One alone exists. It appears as nature's soul. Swami Vivekananda writes in the song of the sannyasin. There is only one awareness. It appears as nature here. Soul, you. So from that awareness, all desires disappear. Hmm. Then the second one. Niyama. What is Niyama? 
सजातीय प्रवाहश्च विजातीय तिरस्कृति नियमो हि परानंदो नियमात्क्रियते बुधे ही the uh, in the yogic terminology what is niyama five practices are there huh? do you remember cleanliness shauja external and inner cleanliness keep your surroundings clothes body clean and mental cleanliness in, inside so shauja then then um you have uh, tapaha hmm austerity Sauca santosha, contentment, contentment regarding my worldly affairs. Not a spiritual contentment. I want to realize God. I want to be enlightened. That kind of discontent should be there. Yes, contentment, santosha, and then tapaha, some amount of austerity. Some people fast. Some people even thing like body wants to slouch and sleep. So I want to sit straight. That is tapaha. I want to go to sleep no i want to go and splash water on my face and be awake that is a victory over of the sentient being over the physical body so all of this self imposed it's unpleasant sometimes it's painful but it's self imposed consciously practiced little bit of austerity what did the buddha do when he first started inquiring he practiced intense austerities for nearly 8 years 7 8 years before he finally attained enlightenment tapaha then um swadhyaya swadhyaya means scriptural study actually the uh, one meaning of swadhyaya is vedic chanting remember this was in the vedic context so regular chanting of the vedas but it also means self study of the scriptures of holy texts and ishvara pranidhanani so ishvara pranidhana that means worship of god a bhakti practice in yoga itself it is included a devotional practice a regular devotional practice where you worship god in whichever form appeals to you so these five are together shauca santosha tapa swadhyaya ishvara pranidhana these five together are called niyama these are moral disciplines now uh, uh, what does shankaracharya say continuously keeping yourself immersed in the in the awareness that i am brahman those who are alert might say swami didn't you say you don't have to do that he said raman sarasvati said wahi to nahi karna hai this is when shankaracharya saying you have to do that continuously that is true at the beginning when you make a breakthrough when you make a breakthrough you begin to get what they are talking about in the path of insight in the path of knowledge then there will be a great desire to remain with that and you should remain with that this is niyama stay with it i am this witness consciousness stay with it somebody used the word very nice marinate when you cook uh, after cooking is finished you don't immediately take it off the uh, of of the stove you put a lid on it let it stew let it marinate let it absorb the the masala the spices similarly once you get it okay i'm done i'm packing my bags and leaving the retreat no marinate in it marinate stay with it it's not something that's to be done and then you go ahead with the rest of your life i remember meeting this young um, seeker in the high himalayas in one of our ashrams called it's called mayavati those who are from india not mayavati the politician mayavati the ashram yes because it won't create confusion here in america but in india it creates confusion i remember i had gone to the mayavati ashram i and another monk and we had come down from there that this is uttar pradesh at that time now it is um, now it is uttaranchal yeah uttarakhand but at that time i had come down from the mayavati ashram and i was standing in the station it's called uh, loha ghat station yes or tanakpur one of them and uh, some people were passing by some the gentleman asked me so swami is which ashram are you from where are you coming from kahan se aa rahe ho where are you coming from i said we are coming from the mayavati ashram and then she said ha ah, uski ashram bhi hai <laughs> oh she's got she, she's the 
She's the chief minister of a state. It's like the governor of a state here. And she, he says, oh, she runs ashrams too. <laughs> no, not that. So in the Mayavati ashram, I was there at one time. And uh, I found this young man who's sitting under a tree and reading the Ashtavakra. Always a, a warning signal if you're sitting under a tree and reading the Ashtavakra earnestly. <laughs> and he looked worried. I said, what happened? He said, I've been trying it and I'm not enlightened yet. I said, it'll... Uh, um, it takes time, you know, keep at it. So, no, I don't like that attitude. Um, Sri Ramakrishna himself said that, that slow, it'll happen in its own time. You know. the intense, up and doing. So he said, see, I have, I ha he's from a, he was from New York. He had a job in Wall Street. No wonder. <laughs> he said, I've taken a two-month leave. It's almost over. I have to go back and I'm still not enlightened. <laughs> it's not like that. That I'll tick it off to-do list, you know, vacation in the Himalayas uh, and enlightenment in the bracket, <laughs> and back to your job. Not like that. Marinate in it. Stay with it. That's what Shankaracharya says. Muhur um, muhu. He says, niyamat kriyati niyamo hi paranando niyamat kriyati budhi. Stay with it continuously. And he says, parananda. This is great bliss, great joy, freedom. Lightness. Because the moment you say niyama in, in Indian languages, niyama means rule. Rule. And when the moment you say rule, it makes people sour, you know. Oh, a rule. It's something you have to, you have to do. And immediately when you say that, the reaction will be, oh, how long? <laughs> One teacher was joking that when you say these days, that, okay, now you have to practice fasting. Now immediately the question is, oh, what can I eat? <laughs> You're supposed to fast. The first question is, what can I eat? <laughs> Hold on to this awareness that I am the witness consciousness. Oh, how long? Not how long. It's fun. It's light. It's joyful. If you know what it is, if you've made the breakthrough, you'll find there's nothing else that you want to do. You want to be with it. That is Niyama. Don't worry, I'm not going to complete. Yeah, good. I said you can have reactions and questions. I'm not going to complete the 15. Because you will see very soon, all of them are saying the same thing. <laughs> Shankaracharya is saying the same thing in all 15. They are, each of them is a gateway to that. Yes. Uh, Swamiji, you, you mentioned um, there's like a certain number of rules. I forgot what they are. Four of the Vedanta, or the study, like prerequisites. They're very similar to what you're talking about here. Yes. And then also you said some teachers in the Yes, uh, rules. They're not rules. They are qualifications. They're called preliminary qualifications. Sadhan Chatushta. Whenever you start teaching Vedanta, the first thing that's to be mentioned are those four. You say, Swami, you skipped it. I skipped it because it's an advanced class. You've heard it again and again, but you must always remember those. You know what they are like. The four are like when you're driving. The teacher said that you have to keep your eyes on certain instruments. The speed, with the speed and the gas and what the mirrors and things like that. There are four things you have to constantly watch in your spiritual journey. Those are the four. They are necessary and they, are, they should be kept in view. If those are there, then Vedanta is strong. If those are not there, Vedanta is weak. What are those four? Viveka. Viveka means the discriminative or analytic insight which, which allows you to separate the eternal from the non-eternal. In Sanskrit, nitya nitya vastu viveka. What is temporary, passing, changing, and what is permanent, unchanging. This distinction. Not a realization, at least a kind of conviction that such a thing is there. Compared to which all this is mundane and passing and temporary. We all have it. Don't look so confused. Otherwise, you won't be here otherwise. If you were totally confused, atheist, then no, there's no such thing at all. 
all this enlightenment and uh, satori and all of that is just uh, silly then you wouldn't be here why would you be wasting your per- perfectly good after uh, uh, weekend listening to uh, 5000 year old philosophy <laughs> so that is viveka the eternal and the non eternal there is an eternal reality and there compared to that everything else is changing second vairagya dispassion dispassion for what dispassion for worldliness for the non eternal for the changing mundane pursuits of the world you may still you have to eat you have to hold a job but now your thing will be i am a spiritual seeker so my fundamental thing in the world is that my sense of satisfaction or goal or purpose in life is not worldly achievement it is enlightenment a pull towards god and a turning away from worldliness does not mean turning away from world worldly action arjuna continued his action in the world you have to continue doing whatever you are doing but that is not your purpose anymore your purpose is enlightenment in bengali sri ramakrishna used to say ishare anurag bishay birag a dispassion for lack of a loss of interest in worldliness some people said that um, i hear this often that this uh, continuous partying on the weekends i find it boring going there and the same talk and I, i can't stand it after a while what do i do that's a good sign that's a good sign you don't have to boast and point it out to your other people those who are interested let them be interested very soon they will say oh she is not she is no fun anymore ashokan ji used to say in his talks in um, san francisco very soon you will say you will find people say oh mom is no fun anymore uh, she is not interested in all this and uh, then he would say good riddance to bad rubbish i say <laughs> good riddance one must mature after some time how long are you going to party on the weekends in 16 it's okay when you're 60 not so not so okay anymore then the third one in the third one six are packed the six fold treasure the six fold treasure do you remember uh, shama mental quietness continuously thinking this and that in a scattered mind not good for vedanta damaha physical quietness i remember once we were studying and uh, one of the brahmacharis used to sit on the floor and our teacher used to the swami used to teach us when the brahmachari is sitting on the floor he, his foot was going like this you know like this and this and the swami said what's that stop <laughs> he got such a shock you know he stopped tamaha quieten down i got i got one of the harshest scoldings i remember till now 25 years ago we were walking back in in the evening to the swami's our, our swami's quarters uh when when uh, we group of brahmacharis novices we were with him we had to, we had to memorize the gita and tell one verse of the gita every day and then he would give us some spiritual teaching which was really good which is a lovely thing i'll i'll remember it all my life those few years i got with him i can tell the name it's swami suhitanand ji who is now the vice president of the order um so those first three years which i got every day almost every day in the night after our work was over from 9 o'clock to 9:30 we would walk uh, the novices and the swami so one day we were walking back um and the swami was about to go into his quarters there was a creeper on the um pillars outside the monks quarters It's with nice flowers and they are fragrant especially at night So as we were walking past I turned around and smelled one you know like that and the swami was there and suddenly stopped and looked at me and so many others surrounding him he looked at me this is not good he said e bhogi kare lo yogi no this is the sign of a person bhogi means one who enjoys the senses yogi is one who withdraws from the senses and the spiritual this is a bhogi it's not a yogi don't do that just because something is available for enjoyment we need to jump jump ahead and enjoy it why and that is dhamma ha control hold back don't let the senses run wild then the third one remember we are in the six fold treasure so shama dhamma uparati uparati means rati means enjoyment of the world uparati means reversal of that enjoyment pulling back 
inwardness. In fact, this example I gave would have been a better example for Uparati, actually, just now they're smelling the flowers. Uparati. Titiksha. Titiksha means um, a spiritual fortitude, a spiritual toughness. See, we put up with so much trouble for our worldly things, for studying, for, you know, you get a student loan, you work an extra job and you go to college. How much hard work that is. And some days you are not, you're not feeling well and you still, you have to. You have to turn up for your job, you have to turn up for class, you have an exam. If you're working in a high paid job, it might sound glamorous, you're a high paid job in Manhattan. But there's no mercy if you're sick or if you're unwell, you have to turn up, you have to perform, they're paying you and they're right. They're paying you so much and didn't, didn't expect that kind of... How much you have to put up with in worldly life. In spiritual life what happens is the moment I get a sneeze, okay, today I'm not so well, I'll cut down my meditation by half. <laughs> no. Spiritual life is the first thing that is sacrificed on the altar of problems. Somebody said something bad to me and, and my mind is so disturbed. I can't pray today. I can't meditate. <laughs> spiritual toughness, come what may. I will get up early in the morning. I will sit for meditation. I've seen monks, actually seen monks who are dying in the, in the ICU of hospitals. You know, in the intensive care unit, there is no, um, there is no, you can't make out whether it's day or night because it's always lit up. Uh, without fail, this monk who died 48 hours, 72 hours later, he would get up at 4 a.m. exactly, just before 4 a.m., struggle up on his bed and sit and meditate. A lifetime's habit. In spite of all troubles, toughness, spiritual toughness. This is the purpose of my life, I will keep doing it, no matter what troubles the world throws at me. This is necessary, to stick on to it. Upar, uh, this is titiksha. titiksha. Then samadhana. Samadhana means focus. Focus on what? On leave everything else aside as far as possible and focus on your Vedantic um, study and practice. Spiritual, your spiritual practice, whatever it is. Samadhana literally means settling down. Now that you have withdrawn from so many things, you have time, you have energy. If you don't settle down on something, they'll get scattered again and they will begin get engaged in the worldly things. Samadhana. So what has been withdrawn from the world, don't let it flow back into the world. Settling down. Then, Shraddha, faith. Faith means, you say, oh, this is the path of knowledge. What do you mean faith again? Faith here means what the teacher is saying and what the texts are saying. I take them that they are real. I don't get it yet. Let me see. Let me try to cultivate it till I get it. It's the kind of faith you have when you sign up for a course in the university. You don't go into the course thinking, the professor is lying. And um, the books are all, uh, you know, they are false. They, they, are, um, they are all full of mistaken stuff. No. You go into it with what kind of uh, mentality? What the professor is saying is correct. What the books are saying is right. It's just that I don't get it yet. Let me persevere. I'll get it. I'll get it in time. That is called um, Shraddha. <laughs> I can't resist telling this a funny story. In Vrindavan, you know Vrindavan in India that is the place of Krishna. It's actually the place of Bhakti. And Jnana is not looked upon well there. It's not the place to practice uh, Vedanta. It's a place to practice Bhakti. Now there was this monk who was a Vaishnavite monk, a devotee, a Bhakta. He decided he will switch tracks and become a Jnani. Uh, so he came to a Vedanta class, he started, said, okay, I'm switching. All that belief in Krishna and all that, um, here you are saying it's based on reason and logic and experience. Yeah, that appeals to me. This is my path. So he started. First of all, the first teaching is the fourfold qualifications. So he comes to the third one, which is Shama, Dhamma, okay, Shama and Dhamma and um, Titiksha. They are very austere. Vaishnava, Vaishnava monks are actually very austere. I've seen them, they stay in little wooden huts, I've seen very, very austere. Uh, titiksha, Uparati, Samadhana, Shraddha, faith. When that was said, he put his pen down and he said, What in Hindi? Kya yaha bhi Shraddha? To mere Vrindavan Bihari Lalji ne kya dosh kya tha? What? You, faith. You got to have faith here all. Here, so, so what was the, what's the fault of my poor Krishna, you know? I could have had faith there as well. <laughs> 
And then the last one is mumukshutvam, an intense desire to be free. So these are the four. You know, like, what were the first three again? <laughs> Viveka. The discrimination analysis between the eternal and non-eternal. Vairagya. Uh, what? Uh, yes. Now, uh, so these are, um, so these are, let me quickly enumerate, Viveka, Vairagya, and then the sixfold, uh, Shama, Dhamma, Uparati, Titiksha, then Samadhana, Shraddha, and the final one is Mokshutva. So these are the four which form the foundation. With these, what happens? All your Vedantic study will lead speedily to the realization that I am that witness consciousness. You will recognize it, you will get it. Without these, what will happen is, you will come out with the feeling, I learned something really cool today. What did it do to you? Nothing. I just wrote down some notes and made a recording. And, and I learned a nice philosophy. With these, enlightenment. Without these, just some more information. I got some more information. Now, he asked a follow-up question. Will this, this jnana lead to these? Now, the thing is, these have to be there for jnana to come up, for the enlightenment to come up. But if you keep practicing it and you begin to get it, will these be enhanced? Yes, it also works that way. It also works that way. But jnana is not meant for generating these. These are meant to help you to generate jnana. It's like you can use a shovel to clear the mud outside. You can even use a, 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 a scalpel from the operating theater to clear the mud, but the scalpel is not meant for that. It will be a very difficult job to clear the mud with the scalpel and you will damage the scalpel also. Okay. So we have uh, run out of time for this session. Next session we will continue. Don't worry, we don't have to complete the 15. It's, this discussion is more important. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu